people. Um, so a lot of new instructors, which is great. That's sort of the vision of today and why we're doing this a lot. There's a bunch of high school teachers, a bunch of community <laughs> college teachers. Um, so they just came out of a lab and you know they just had like a ton of questions of like what is this thing and what is this error message and what is this grader doing and you know this is running in a funny way <clears throat> so people have already had a bunch of questions around like how to make this not seem intimidating it's, it's a little hard to explain of like yes that's totally happens on you know stuff like that happens on the first day of a class but you know by the time you're in the flow of the class uh students have have become resilient to like you know, figure out and reload stuff. Um, but certainly the vision for this session is just you guys sharing your experience and, and how, you know, you see using these materials and teaching this way. A lot of it's about, you know, the teaching workflow and the technology and the tech stack and stuff. Um, so up to you guys to, to share. Um, I think we're going to... We're going to wait to get to 100. We're almost oh, there. No, we're, we're almost there. I'm going to kick it off with Solomon, who I was going to say is um, at a California community college that has been articulated to UC Berkeley. So the vision is like you could take a data eight like class at community college. And then when you get to UC Berkeley, that would give you the credit and start you on the major. Um, so uh, lots of vision about how we can make that a, a sustainable pathway for more and more students. So I'm going to put Solomon on right now. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Um, and uh, I'm going to share my screen. If everything works OK. Oh, yeah. All right. So can you guys see what I'm seeing? Looks good. Looks good. OK. Uh, so here is my presentation. Um, so I will uh, try to go through this rather quickly. Um, there's, I'm going to talk a lot about, uh, how we got started. Um, some of the things we did in preparation, um, kind of the lessons learned. We just finished teaching data, data science, uh, last Thursday. So, uh, we just submitted, uh, uh grades. So, uh, this is really going to be kind of like a debrief for me, um, to think about a lot of the things, um, that we've, uh, we're, we're still kind of like fleshing through. So. Um, my name is Solomon Russell, as Eric said. Um, I teach at El Camino College. Um, it's really awesome that I'm on this uh, panel with uh, two people um, from Howard and University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. I went to high school across the street from Howard University and um, actually working on uh, adapting Prairie Learn, which is some software that has been developed by University of Illinois um, to help with tests and um, uh, generating random like questions for tests. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So who we are, we are a two-year college in Los Angeles County. Um, we serve a very diverse community, uh, students from in areas from Manhattan Beach um, to Inglewood. And um, in the division that I'm in, uh, I am in the Mathematical Sciences Division, which has three departments, math, computer science, and engineering. So having a connection with math and computer science uh, wasn't, there weren't too many barriers to it uh, just because of the makeup of um, our division. Great. Um, how we got started in data science is um, I started teaching a, uh, a BJC class, uh, The Beauty and Joy of Computing. And I actually saw Brian Harvey, uh, a, a professor, I think emeritus at Berkeley, who's uh, I think here on the, uh, the, the session. That was a course that was really developed by, um, well, the AP Computer Science Principles course of which BJC is a flavor was developed by NSF and the College Board. And we started teaching that in 2017 um, to uh, our college students. Through that, I kept hearing about data science. Uh, there were these connections between the BJC course and foundations of data science. And after I taught that for a few semesters, I said, okay, let me click on this link and see what's happening. Um, and once I saw it, um, it was one of those things where I didn't know what data science was really, but I knew I liked it. Right? So immediately um, we put together a um, presentation for other teachers at our school 
And um, even though I really didn't know what data science was, I, I, I saw one video and I put this graph up and we start talking about uh, little women and uh, it just kind of took off from there. Uh, Alice Martinez is another professor that I uh, work with in the math department and um, Topher Allen is a student who I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, we came up with a data science plan um, we really wanted to see um, what was the lay of the land in terms of data science. There were some high school programs around um, that uh, in the area, like uh, Intro to Data Science that uh, UCLA has developed. Um, and there were these programs in data science at four years in the area that were sprouting up. And then we also saw that there were a lot of four profit companies. And uh, we saw that a lot of students um, were, were going to them uh, to pay to take a boot camp or something. So we thought that there was an opportunity for us to be able to provide something for the, 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 the students that we serve. We started by promoting the class. So when we decided we were going to teach it, um, we, uh, we prepared by um, um, you know, calling in some favors and probably doing some things we shouldn't have done. Um, but we were able to uh, promote the class rather extensively. Uh, we went on TV, we got a, a press release uh, put out. Um, during the same time that we were developing the Foundations of Data Science course, which is kind of like the same thing as uh, Data 8, um, uh, we found out that there was another course, Data Driven Persuasion, that was being developed by Chris Wells, uh, a professor in communications at El Camino. So it was a nice synergy um, that we had two data science courses coming on in the same semester, which was this spring 2021. So uh, there I am, um, two other professors, we team taught this class together. So it was very similar to uh, the way that Berkeley uh, taught the class, at least they do on the edX course. Um, we did a pretty faithful job of adhering to what they did in Data 8. Um, uh, we had four sections, about 71 students, three professors. We team taught, like I said. We had two volunteer tutors, uh, Topher Allen, who's uh, uh, displayed at the bottom. He's He has an interesting story. He actually went to Berkeley in 2019 because he searched around L.A., all around L.A., for data science classes. He couldn't find it. He went up there and then he came back and at the same time that we were kind of like creating this. So he's really done so much um, for uh, this and offered to like help students. So what was great with uh, Berkeley is that they're just so generous in terms of um, the support that they give to they gave to us. So they gave us an out of the box canvas shell. So. Uh, like right after they gave that to us uh, for some like campus stuff, I needed a syllabus. So I was able to change a few things around and basically have um, a syllabus that I could give to some administrators that wanted to see some things. Um, if we um, if I had to teach this class alone by myself, I definitely would have used a lot of their videos and maybe done something like a flip classroom. Um, but because we were team teaching it, we were able to um, um, like actually teach it live. So the infrastructure, so uh, we use the 2i2c, um, kind of like cloud bank uh, platform. Um, when I first started looking at data science, you know, I saw that, okay, I could get a server, and then I found out that I'd probably have to do the sysadmin, which I really, really didn't want to have to do. Um, so um, luckily, um, right as we were starting, this project was started, and we were in the pilot phase. So. Um, we were able to give all of our students Jupyter Hubs. So uh, we had a Jupyter Hub for El Camino College. Students were able to log in to uh, their Jupyter notebooks and actually do a lot of, do all their assignments there, which was a really, really big benefit. Um, after like the first week, uh, this is kind of like the feedback that we got from students um, on how easy it was to, to learn Jupyter Hub. Jupyter Lab, or just to get logged in and deal with all the uh, technical issues because it was through the browser. Uh, students didn't have to download anything. Um, and probably, I'm guessing, some of the students that rated us one, two, and three probably had issues with just like authentication, right? So just logging in. But after that first week or so, um, pretty much everybody was able to get in. Um, one of the big things with this is I did not want to have to troubleshoot problems. And I didn't wind up having to do a lot of that. We did have one issue with like some Git uh, conflicts. 
um, that uh, Professor Chan um, uh, uh, dealt with. But other issues, we had some issues. I uh, put in a ticket request and inside of an hour, um, it was resolved. So that was a big, big relief. Um, this is kind of like the, the students. These are, um, this is self-reported, but you can see that we had a lot of um, diversity in this class. We had a lot of computer scientists, also a lot of people that were in engineering and statistics, but then we had a lot of other um, uh, majors. Um, I know for a fact we had two lawyers, people that were uh, admitted to the bar in California, actually taking this class. So uh, it was really popular and very, very diverse, more diverse than uh, more diverse than a class I've ever taught before. So these are some of the numbers for uh, enrollments. And there are some things that I'm really, really um, um, happy about. One. If you look here for African-Americans, CS8 is the data science course that we offered. Um, we had 12.7% enrollment. Um, if you look at, uh, uh, you know, the enrollment of CS courses in fall 2019, it's about 4.9%. So that's a sizable jump. And uh, as a school, um, it's usually between 12 and 13%. Um, in terms of uh, women, uh, we had uh, almost a third of the class um, uh, uh, were female. So that was really gratifying, especially when looking at the statistics of our classes, um, our CS classes in general. Um, one thing um, that wasn't so promising is our completion rate. So um, for a couple of groups that I'll single out, um, um, African-Americans, uh, 33% completed the class. So after they started, they actually completed and got a grade. Uh, for Hispanics, that was 40%. Um, and then here in the far right corner, um, for people with no prior experience, um, it was 39% as opposed to 70% for people that had taken a computer science course before. All right. So it looks to be some type of association. So some of the lessons learned. Um, team teaching definitely made this course a lot easier. Um, I'm a computer scientist. So the first third of the course where we're really focusing on um, uh, students learning how to code and how to manipulate tables and how to visualize things, which is a lot of um, the, the part where they're really starting to, they're, they're learning Python. That was an easier transition for me and Professor Chan. Uh, Professor Martinez, who's a math professor, um, she really, uh, there were points in time when she came to us and said like, hey, how does this exactly work? What is this method here? What do, what do these things mean? And vice versa, when we got to the kind of second half of the class, like kind of inferential thinking, which was much more statistics, we were relying on her. Students would ask me about confidence intervals and I would start explaining it and then realize halfway through that I needed to tag somebody in and did that a few times. Um, one of the things that we, um, we did because we were pretty faithful to the curriculum is we pretty much got through everything that they get through in data eight. And um, we lost a lot of students, as you can see, um, as you saw on that last uh, page, we had, I think, 56% uh, uh, of the students that enrolled uh, past census actually complete the class. And uh, a lot of students struggled at the very beginning, especially with the, uh, the, the Python part. Like if they hadn't taken a computer science course, and this is some of the anecdotal stories that we heard is that they, they really struggled. Um, computational thinking helps. Um, so we, we really started thinking about um, um, maybe having that CS, um, that beauty and joy of computing class really be kind of a lead in to our data science class um, since it teaches computational thinking, especially the way that we do it through um, a block based language with a little bit of Python at the very end. And that course really fits in well because there's a big portion about ethics and societal impacts, which directly connect to uh, data science. So including that in a way of being in some future certificate or associate's degree to incentivize students to take that. Um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. I love this quote. Um, we really, um, I think the, the things we could have done better is really focus in on culture. Um, our students aren't Berkeley students. And um, by kind of um, pushing them so hard, um, I think a lot of students lost motivation. 
Um, so there's some things that on the next slide that I'll talk about that we, we really could have done in order to help with, mo uh, with motivation. Um, peer interaction, some of the things that really worked well was the Piazza page. So uh, that's uh, uh, used prevalently in, uh, at Berkeley and that was really so useful. Um, students were posting, helping each other. So that really helped with uh, uh, creation of a, uh, a good culture in the classroom. So one of the big things that we noticed was motivation from some of our students kind of like um, waned as the semester went on. And I really started thinking about like the constructs of motivation, um, active choice, people choosing to start something, persistence, continuing on, um, the effort that they put through, put on um, um, when learning. I think we did a really good joy, uh, job with active choice. Um, we really promoted the course well, uh, I think the enrollment that we had really shows that. Persistence, we had some issues with persistence. Um, some of the things we could have done better, um, instructional scaffolding. So Professor Martinez was a really big proponent of, um, we should have uh, uh, walked them through some of those earlier labs to really give them some like early wins. Um, we really could have made the content more meaningful for students. So we took a lot of the examples from Berkeley, um, but uh, they were from like coffee shops around Berkeley. And while that didn't seem like it was the most, the, the highest priority thing for us to focus in on, I think that would have helped to make it a little bit more relatable. And then also, if I had to go back, I would have put in something where they would have found their own data set and done something interesting. Didn't have to be very like robust, but just something that would have been a little bit more meaningful for them. And um, because we were doing this online, we didn't get a chance to really have students really work together. Um, in my computer science classes, I do a lot of pair programming, and I think that that really would have helped for them to be able to see other student models. What's next? Um, the creation of a certificate and associate's degree. So uh, we are partnering with Santa Barbara City College. Um, they're the lead institution on uh, a grant that we just uh, uh, put on um, with uh, Natalie uh, Goebbels. Um, and uh, we hope to create another computer science class and another math for data science class. Um, we um, are also working on question generation with Prairie Learn. Um, so I'm a co-PI on a grant with UC Berkeley and also uh, Cal State Long Beach to adapt the great work that they've done at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign um, to create uh, more questions for students to work specifically around data science. So I'm really excited about that. We wanna have a data science day in 2021 to really foster this kind of culture at our campus of data science. Um, with that, we also wanna have um, some uh, a data science club. Um, where we're going in, um, in, um, in fall, we're gonna have six sections, so hopefully about 120 students. I'm gonna teach two of those sections on campus. Four of them are gonna continue to be online. And we're looking to partnerships with other community colleges. We've reached out to some of um, like Compton College to talk to them of if we can uh, work hand in hand on things like Data Science Day. Um, and these are a few things that our students are saying about the class that I thought were nice to put in. Um, I think that they really appreciated that this was available to them at the community college level. So I think I'm at the end of my time. So great. So hello, everyone. My name is Gloria. Um, hope you can hear me. Uh, I am an assistant professor at Howard University in Washington, D.C. And so I'll be going over um, how we implemented the data aid curriculum into our current computer science program. I'll share my screen. Okay. Okay. So um, I hope you guys can all see this. Um, is it full screen for everyone? Looks good. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, as part of Howard University, as mentioned, Gloria Washington, assistant professor, um, we've been teaching data science, I believe, for the last four years. But however, what we started to do is partner with Microsoft and create a Microsoft Data Science Fellows Program. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. But the Microsoft Data Science Fellows Program is to introduce undergraduates to data science and so that they can get interested in it and they can start to interview for jobs at 
Microsoft. Um, we have a big partnership with Microsoft. They support a lot of our introductory programming courses. So it was a natural transition to actually work with them for this initiative. And we were introduced to the data science curriculum through our Microsoft contacts, which is um, Mr. Harold um, Yavi. So just to give you a little bit of background about Howard University. At Howard, we're undergraduate, mainly um, institution. Um, the computer science program in general is usually made of 71% um, women and 29% men. 76% um, of the actual students in the um, department are Black or African American. Then we also have a big Nepali um, population, and then the rest are others. So the initial goals was to utilize the UC Berkeley's data A curriculum in our applied data science course. As mentioned, it had been taught previously by another professor. That professor left and then I took it over. So what I wanted to do was to make sure that I gave um, undergraduate students experience with hands-on data science techniques that are so socially and culturally relevant to these hot button topics that they like to deal with and that, you know, sort of interests our students. And then I also wanted to give undergraduate teaching assistants opportunity to provide hands-on help to their students. Usually we employ this kind of model in our introductory programming courses. So um, from the perspective of like utilizing it for the actual applied data science class where we implemented data eight, it kind of fit naturally. And mention is that data science, our applied data science course is required by um, all computer science majors. However, we also got College of Computing persons who were interested in it, and then we got some sociology people who took the class as well. But the point of it was to create opportunities for Howard to grow collaborations with other universities and to also create publications as it relates to computer science education and some of the unique things that we're doing in relation to using the data aid curriculum. So the overall observations, um, as mentioned, we taught this course fall 2020, which was like at the height of the pandemic. And of course, you know, teaching during a pandemic can be difficult with new curriculum. However, they kind of took to it. Um, students had many opportunities to submit the labs and we adapted the data aid curriculum where you had labs. Um, we just adapted them so that they can pick out data sets relevant to a socially and culturally relevant topic that they wanted to do. An example of a topic is uh, social justice was huge around that time. So a lot of people looked at um, gun violence or police shootings or um, stuff like that, which is it's a little bit depressing, but you know, some of the things that were going on at that time. Uh, as mentioned, all of the students were computer science majors except for three, and they were non-computer science majors. They were from outside colleges. Uh, so in total, we had about 51 people. Um, also mentioned, we did not use every specific lesson within the data aid curriculum because um, our students came in the door at either a junior or senior level. They had already had a Python class. They already knew introduction to Python. They were novice um, Python programmers and had been doing Python for at least uh, a year and a half. So we didn't have to um, go into that into the um, introductory lesson. So it kind of helped us where we were able to jump in. One of the unique things that we were able to do with this class is to forage and use the um, supplement to data eight, which is uh, there's a data munging lesson, which is scraping um, data actually from websites and then pulling together different data sets and making your own unique data set. So that was some of the things that we wanted them to implement and that they had to know. Um, from a Microsoft perspective, it was also mentioned that those are the kind of questions that they would get if they got a technical interview related with being able to work in a data science position. So they needed to know how to do that. Um, so overall student performance, um, as mentioned, uh, there was a big jump in the fall 2019 versus fall 2020 course. Um, 
about the number of students who actually took the course. The reason being is because in fall 2019, a lot of the students were way into their last semester or the semester before their last semester as a senior and in wait to take the course, which is totally fine. So like we had 51 students and so it presented an opportunity, at least for me to be able to implement this data science fellows where I would have two individual undergraduate students who have already been well versed in the data science curriculum and could help me. Um, overall student performance, an average grade was 89%. The median was about 74%. I will say uh, some of the uh, non computing students didn't do as well as the computing students. And the reason truly is because of those introductory lessons to Python. And it was an assumption, even in the syllabus that, you know, they have already had taken our CS0 course, which is introduction of Python. So was a little bit of variance in between like um, the way that the computing students form, performed and the way that the non-computing students performed. And I know I'm going very fast. However, we'll have uh, questions at the end too. So one of the challenges that we actually, I would say encountered was, um, we had implemented our own Littlest Jupiter Hub implementation. And so before we started with the data science curriculum, we talked with Eric and some of the other people at Data Ada, like what is the correct sort of implementation that we need to do? So we had implemented our own. And basically, I, I don't think we had enough credits or we didn't have enough, um, I don't know, whatever was going on with our server implementation, it kind of messed things up because it down at least four times. So luckily the data aid curriculum, um, working with Eric, we were able to implement the 2Y2C Jupyter Hub implementation, which was supported by Berkeley and NSF Cloud Bank. And this actually allowed us to kind of unload the server um, maintenance and all the administration was done by um, the 2I2C. And it allowed me more time for grading instead of worrying about if we had enough credits or restarting the server or um, individuals actually losing their uh, homework. And that was some of the things that would happen when the server would go down because it was just no way for us to log in for them. So once we got over that hurdle, which occurred, I would say the first month was a really a beast, but getting through not having to do with administration of the server really worked out well for us. And so from the students' perspectives, um, I had the two teaching assistants, which were Ms. Michaela Orange, who was a senior computer science student at the time. She graduated this May, and then Anthony Gordon, who was also a senior computer science student. As mentioned, the final grade distributions were 89%. So about, I would say this was one of the highest grades, at least as it relates to this applied data science class that we had had out of um, the four years that we had taught the course. And the reason being is because um, with a lot of the labs, I gave them the opportunity to submit their best and um, final. And then if they had things that they knew were um, problems with a specific lab, they could go back and, and resubmit it. And the reason being is because we were we were working during a pandemic and I know like I was working during a pandemic like they were. So I didn't want to create any extra burden on them. I wanted them to actually be able to apply the lessons to real life examples. Um, so we had really fruitful conversations as it related to ethics, data science, transparency, because it's a real need at Howard University that we're pushing with all of our courses is to get the students to understand um, how to be an ethical data scientist or an ethical computer scientist in general. So that was one of the things that I did with my discussion board was ask them um, as they're pulling data from these websites, what are the things that they need to be mindful of? Could this data um, interpretation and the way that they actually present the results actually be used to harm a particular group 
or could it be misconstrued by others who are um, looking at it from the outside? So although the students, you know, they would chime in in these conversations, but at the end of at the end in the survey, they said they didn't like them, but I think they really did. I think they were lying. <laughs> okay, uh, so our first future work is to, what we want to do is there is a respect computer science education course where we're going to, um, not course, but conference, where we're going to actually submit an experience report based off of our use of the data aid curriculum compared to other um, semesters that we had. And then also, as mentioned, we are um, implementing a minor this is the minor in data science. Sorry for the dog barking. The minor in data science will be for computer science um, bachelors, but then we're also implementing a master's in data science and then a certificate in data science. And so the master's in data science and the certificate will be with a partnership with a to be named um, university that we're trying to go about um, pushing this out hopefully within the next year, but we're, we want to have it where anyone with, with any kind of degree, and that could be a non-computer science degree, a sociology degree, could come in and get a master's in data science, or if they're a working professional, get a certificate in data science. So I know I went through this a little bit quickly, but um, as we start to answer questions, one of the takeaways that you guys can take away from this presentation is that from the Howard University perspective, um, we really tried to make sure that the students were able to pick their projects and that we modified the data eight labs to be socially and culturally relevant um, using different data sets. Um, thank you for allowing me to present and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Gloria. Are you ready for us, Eric? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready if you guys are ready. Can you see the share screen button? Yep. <laughs> I think we're good. Can everyone Looks see great. our slides? Awesome. Okay, perfect. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Carly Flanagan. I'm from the Department of Statistics at the University of Illinois, and this is... I'm Wade Fignolmsteiner. I'm from the Department of Computer Science here at the University of Illinois. And both of us have taught our basically version of Data 8 for the past two years, so we're going to tell you a little bit about data science at Illinois. So when we were designing our intro to data science course, we wanted our students to know that kind of just like everybody basically needs to know Microsoft Office um, for any job, we believe that basic data science is going to be required for every job in the future. So we wanted to, to design a course where students could basically use Python kind of like they use Excel to do even more interesting things with data. And here at Illinois, we, um, we like to say we did the impossible because the team working on our course somehow got four deans to all say yes at the same time to creating a data science program and especially creating this platform course to start with. Um, our data science program is a four college effort between the College of Engineering, Liberal Arts and Sciences, School of Information Sciences, and then the College of Business. So we've all kind of been working together to um, make this program. And I'm gonna, we're gonna talk to you today about three goals for data science education at Illinois. And the first one is to provide a meaningful data science education curriculum at the University of Illinois. So we started off developing our intro class and we wanted it to be so that every student who gets into Illinois, regardless of their background or their major, can take this course and learn data science. So we before we started this program there were a bunch of courses kind of at the university in different departments that were already teaching data science but there wasn't any co cohesion they weren't working together there were just kind of random courses in different departments doing their own thing and so we wanted to make everything fit together and make sure that all these people doing awesome things were in contact with each other and working together 
So we decided to provide basic skills in what we call our platform data science courses and then build our data science degrees on top of those platform courses. So the, the main course that we're gonna talk about today is data science discovery, which again is our kind of version of data eight. It actually was inspired by me going to this conference two or three years ago. And we do a lot of similar things that what the other presenters talked about as well, but it's a freshman level quantitative reasoning general education requirement. So again, we wanted students from all across campus. We didn't want this to be a class that just our stat and CS and computer science majors took. We wanted to have a wide variety of students. And we made sure that for this class, there were no prerequisites that every student in Illinois can go ahead and take this course. Um, one thing we did decide as well was that we were going to have two faculty teaching this class. So Wade and I both come from different departments and even different colleges. I'm in liberal arts and sciences and he's in the College of Engineering. And so we both teach the class together. And one thing that we kind of learned, I guess, through teaching it was that the students really like when we both are involved in every single lesson. I think at first we had this idea that I was gonna talk about the statistics topics and then Wade would demonstrate them in Python like separately. But they really, this, our students really liked kind of us having a more of a back and forth conversation. And we do a lot of examples where I'll approach a problem from one way and explain that to them. And then he'll approach and it. And I'll be like, let's nerd out with some code and do some code. Yeah, exactly. Um, so like I said, our course is called Data Science Discovery. It's actually cross-listed with statistics, computer science, and information sciences. Um, again, we wanted it to be very accessible to students and not look scary uh, with the CS name in particular. So this course provides fundamental data science to all students. We have a list of topics that we cover, um, pretty straightforward for introductory statistics. And then um, with Python, Wade, do you want, want to talk a little bit about, because we do something slightly different than Berkeley. Yeah, one thing that we decided to choose a slightly different path than the data eight was we went and really talked to a lot of industry folks and a lot of people who are hiring data scientists. And we saw that they really wanted students with industry experience, industry skills. So these were things like pandas, these were things like Git, these were things like using the command line. So really focus this course along using Git to get the assignment. So instead of downloading a zip file or uploading a zip file, they are running it Git commit, Git checkout, Git clone, Git add, all the Git commands. Um, and we're doing that at the command line instead of using interface, just so even in 107, they're not learning exactly the inner details of Git, but they are typing the commands. They see that they, they add files, they commit files and push files, that that goes to the server and then we do grading on the Git infrastructure. So a lot of our Python is really revolving around like what is industry using right now and how can we give those skills so that students can get an internship that very summer after taking discovery. Yeah. And then along with statistics and computation, we also focus a lot on privacy, ethics, and impact of data. And that's kind of woven in throughout the whole course. It's not just a topic that we talk about at the beginning, but it's something that we keep talking about from day one until the last day of class. Uh, and then just some details about how we run data science discovery. There's three hours of lecture per week. So it's usually taught on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then we do have a two hour uh, discussion section where they complete uh, labs and they use Jupyter Notebooks and Python. This, we really encourage the students to work together. We try and host these labs in classrooms where they can be sitting at tables, um, working in small groups. And the teaching team, like we said, consists of us graduate TAs running those discussion and lab sections. And then we have a team of undergraduate course assistants who consists of students who have taken the class previously that um, come to the labs, they help out with office hours and kind of look over things before we release them to the students. So that's definitely one thing that we kind of stole Berkeley's model of doing that. Um, and this course, we started it in spring 2019. The first semester we taught it, we actually had a small pilot section and we 
kind of handpicked um, 20 students from 20 different majors. We had a bunch of students that wanted to take the class and we specifically wanted to get a wide variety of students in terms of majors so that we could get feedback during that building semester that we were making the course. And then starting in fall 2019 and beyond, this class has been offered each semester and it's definitely growing. Um, I think we have about probably we're going to have about 300 students take it in the fall and we have the capacity to expand even more often. And now this course is, it's not only a gen ed, but it's being required for some of the different majors on campus. So we think that we're going to see a lot of growth in the next couple of years. And then um, anything else about the infrastructure? Yeah. And part of that, like we, we ended up going the different route. We don't have a Jupyter hub set up instead for assignment submissions. We have that all get it based. Um, they do use Jupyter notebooks. So they go to the command line, type Jupyter Notebook to open up their Jupyter Notebook. And then they work on their Python within the notebook environment. More and more, we're moving some of the in-class exercises to Google Colab because it's just so easy to get a browser window open and get Python coding like within about three seconds of them clicking a link. And then uh, the first course, Data Science Discovery, is the, the first course also in a start of data science degrees at Illinois. So instead of having just one data science degree and we kind of were trying to figure out which department that should be hosted out of, we decided to actually go a different route and have departments able to offer what we're calling X plus data science degrees, where a specific department such as um, like psychology could have a psychology plus data science degree where their students would take whatever courses they would need for that psychology degree, um, a bunch of data science courses that we kind of designed to be taken in a specific order so that they can learn the different data science skills. And then hopefully some courses that, that also combine that X and data science as well. And so I'm going to talk a bit about the data science, the plus data science part of this, because we spent a lot of time thinking what's the best way. We, we, this was one of the first times in a while that we were developing a curriculum from scratch. So we wanted to figure out what was what were the most important courses that students needed to take and then how should they take them? And like I said, we collaborated with the four different departments and spent a lot of time thinking about this. Um, so here are the eight courses that students take for the data science part of those X plus data science degrees. And you can see we actually have two courses that are led by statistics, two courses from math, two courses from computer science, and then two courses from the iSchool or the School of Information Sciences. And the first two courses from statistics are data science discovery, which is the intro course we teach, and then data science exploration, where they kind of go into more, they become more independent data scientists and it's less of an introduction and more of kind of exploring data and doing analysis that's not necessarily like telling them exactly what to do. Um, and then the math courses, we knew that students needed calculus. We did have kind of a, I don't want to say a debate, but a discussion about whether or not we needed Calc 2 and Calc 3 as a part of this. And ultimately, we decided we didn't want to put a bunch of prereqs that weren't going to be absolutely necessary. So we said they could take any Calculus 1 course, and that should be good. Um, and then we also said we, they definitely need linear algebra. So some faculty here at Illinois are currently developing a linear algebra for day class, and that is going to hopefully be piloted in this fall. Um, and then do you want to talk about the yeah, CS hearing, courses? So to kind of wrap this up here, computer science, we are actually developing a algorithms and data structures course. So a CS2 style course, specifically for data science students, knowing they have the Python background of coming from STAT 107 and 207. And then we have a modeling and learning in data science. They take after data science exploration. And that's sort of the pinnacle course in the technical path through data science where they actually apply machine learning models, look at data sets and decide how do you tune the models the right way? How do you visualize those results? How do you interpret those results? And then the iSchool is offering two courses that focus more on the policy and ethics side of things where they have experts that know that the students are coming in with a lot of Python experience, but they may not see how much of an impact they can make with their analysis. So they get to nerd out with the iSchool on some of that work. And then a visual representation of those eight courses and um, the where the Calc 1 fits into that. 
Um, and there's Python programming in at least five of these courses. So definitely the um, 107, 207, and then the two CS courses and the math course, they will see a lot of Python. And we actually did some, this is a fun fact, we kind of did some data science to pick the numbers for the courses and we tried to end all of them in seven because I guess at Illinois, that's the least commonly used number for a course. So we wanted the departments to know if they wanted to make a data science course, they should make it end in a seven. So the students hopefully will know that. Um, and then, like we said, so for the degree, basically what it looks like is they're going to have their area of specialization, the X, the data science core, their gen eds and electives. And then we are going to have at the end kind of a data science research or discovery experience where they either do an internship or anything that they can actually take those skills that they learned through the major and use in real life. Uh, the second goal for data science education at Illinois is to is, is kind of on board with what I was just talking about. We want to provide a meaningful data science research or discovery experience for all the students in these majors because we know that they're going to be nerding out with data science in class, but we want to make sure that they have opportunities to do this outside of class as well. Um, and then this this is going to look very different from different for different students. So we've had a lot of diversity in terms of major. Uh, like we said in that first spring semester, we had um, I I think it was we started with 20. started with twenty and ended with sixteen um, students from sixteen different majors. And then in the next academic year, we actually had fifty eight different declared majors and then thirty five undeclared majors. Um, and data science discovery has been one of the fastest courses, growing courses at Illinois, and um, definitely one of the largest introductory data science programs in the country. And oh, go ahead. You so one special bit um, is as part of like doing coursework and thinking about degrees, we want to think about what does undergraduate research look like? How do we give undergraduates an opportunity to do a project? So one thing we're spinning up just now, something we're calling D7, again, with the seven for data science theme that you're that we're building out around Illinois, is a research group that's exclusively for undergraduate students, where students can work on projects with a faculty member who wants undergraduates to work on data science work. And we're just spinning that up right now to start thinking about how does how do we grow a real program around data science for students? and give them as many opportunities as possible to actually use their data science skills. Um, and then the last goal is to, we definitely wanted to make this data science community for the campus. We know Berkeley does a great job at that and we wanted to bring faculty um, in who maybe hadn't done data science before or who were doing data science in other departments and um, didn't have anyone to collaborate with. So we're also doing the idea of connector courses and um, are creating a bunch of resource, resources for faculty in different departments who either want to create one of the X plus data science majors or um, create a course, data science course in their subject. And then with this uh, idea of creating this data science community, we we know that at Illinois, um, a lot of times our courses can be in these walled gardens. And even though they're beautiful gardens, we, they're not accessible to anyone because they're behind things like Blackboard, Moodle, now Canvas. Um, and so we want to make things as public as possible. And so all of our assignments are actually open and accessible for anyone to view. Um, we also use Prairie Learn. And so we have a bunch of different randomized questions, especially about a lot of the statistics topics um, that are open for anyone. All of our notes and course handouts are on our website. We don't have an external textbook or anything like that. And all of our data sets are open, public, and curated. They're ready to be used um, for any faculty at Illinois or even outside of Illinois. And then um, everyone has access to basically everything that we use for this course. And then kind of to end our part of the talk, the lessons that we learned, the first one is that two professors definitely works better than one professor. Like I said earlier, we got a lot of feedback from students that they really like when we interact with each other rather than me teach one, one part and we teach one part of the lesson. So we've been trying to incorporate that. Um, also, we've been using real data for all examples. I know at least me teaching statistics, sometimes it's easy to make up data or just have different descriptive statistics, but we actually 
really want to show for every example we use that this is the data set that it's coming from. And we actually do in the course, we do a new data set each week that kind of works well for whatever topics we're teaching. And these consist of Illinois themed data sets and some classic statistical data sets. So students are exposed to all of that. In addition, we found that students really enjoyed learning industry standard tools so they can use that tool as they move out the industry. And we have a lot of projects where we don't have a single solution where they get to. They have a lot of choices where students can choose what images they want to use and what filters they want to apply to those images and how do they want to generate their final deliverable in a way that every single student re has a different thing they're turning in. Because I find there's nothing more demoralizing than knowing you and 200 other people worked on the exact same assignment and got the exact same result and wrote the exact same code. Why don't you just, and sort of having a different result also helps making sure that there's academic integrity in the course and that everyone knows that they have their own result um, at the end of the experience. And then building out the connector courses has been just so fun learning about so many different topics that I knew nothing about and just seeing hundreds of data scientists across campus. So I think that's it. And two questions. Yeah, we can answer any questions anyone's have. I will stop sharing my screen. And Solomon and Gloria, I don't know if you guys want to come back up. Uh, there's a bunch of questions in Q&A. There's one I saw early on, Solomon, I just wondered if you could touch on really quick that was like uh, something like, what about persistence? Is that just a general problem at community colleges? I, I think I think so. It is in general a problem, but I think particularly around um, data science this last semester, we, we saw issues with it. Now, we did try to create something new. We did create something new during the middle of a pandemic <laughs> online. <laughs> so persistence for everyone was an issue, um, but it's something that we want to definitely be mindful of. Um, of, of having like uh, Berkeley does such a great job with like culture for their classes, right? With like data aid and BJC and having those models and having students that you can talk to that can encourage you, I think um, is one of the things that we can do to really help students persist. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, I don't know, there's a bunch of other questions about sharing syllabus. UIUC, they asked, uh, do, you, do your students ever see R? So, so that's in, a yeah, that's a great question. So if you're taking a more computer science track, you don't end up seeing R, but if you take statistics. If you take, um, if you're a statistics major or take any of our statistics courses with programming, we use R all the time. Yeah. And in this, um, yeah, in the data science sequence, we decided to stick, we figured we should kind of stick with one. So we decided to use Python for all those 07 courses, but if they take more statistics class, CR. And um, at Howard Fall 2019, we used our programming as well with Codeo, which was a totally different um, curriculum. Okay. Um, anybody want to take on any of these other things in the Q and A? Um, websites to use to get data. Well, I, I can chime in a little bit that with the websites that we use, Department of Education, um, Department of Criminal Justice, um, DC, of, um, they did a lot of web scraping um, within my class. And I do believe that was some of the issues that we had encountered with um, the first server going down. And as you know, with, if you know anything about web scraping, if a student decides to just suck in a whole chunk of data and the rest of the other students are trying to do that. So anyway, um, hindsight, I would do this for them uh, in fall 2021. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's easy for web scraping to escape uh, the confines and become a very large process. Um, any other good questions in here you want to take on? I guess there's an interesting question of like, you know, uh, UIUC in the 107 class where like if you're a CS major, maybe it's too basic for you. 
but um so so i guess there's that program design question of like you want that like intro class everyone can take no prereqs and we face this we're like we want everyone to come through that class and then they'll get this foundation and they'll get you know they'll get the ethics question they'll get a lot of like framework but there's people that come in with a bunch of cs experience that you know this is they might be spinning their wheels um we we actually try and discourage students who are too qualified from taking the course just to kind of try and tamp down on imposter syndrome and sort of just seeing the person who does the assignment in 10 minutes because they've already seen exposure. So we have uh, the computer science sort of major has a different CS1 course that okay. we encourage students who have background programming experience, especially if they've gone through any AP courses or AP principles courses, that this is really not the place for them to start. So that we really want it to be beginner friendly and that there's not students there who are getting the assignments done in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. I have also at Howard been approached for creating a separate class, not only for chemical engineering, chemistry, um, art history, African American history. So we're trying to um, go about how we're even going to uh, offer these data science, you know, specific courses in the future. But um, it, it across the board, it's something that we at Howard need to have like a non CS kind of course for our cor for our students, just like you guys have. We need more Gloria's. Definitely. Um, and I would love to just touch on the like, you know, the awesome students, I, I guess, like Solomon's case, he had Topher. And I, it's like a funny thing, like you couldn't have told, you couldn't have said before, like, you know, the success of the class depends on the Topher. And in Gloria's class, she had, I met those students and, you know, they were able to just do some key things on the server side and the homework side. And, and, uh, I don't know, do you guys wanna just go around and comment on like how you cultivate and create that awesome student help? I I, I think you you um, more cultivating than creating, right? Um, and, and, I'm, and, and I'm a big, big proponent in listening to people um, because there are students, and this is the thing, people came out from corners, from dark alleys when we, announced that we had a data science class. Um, people that I, I knew about data science before I did, to say, hey, actually, I was thinking about going to college. And just tapping into uh, those students as resources was so beneficial. I mean, the course we would not have had, we went from two sections to three sections to four sections. And that was because of the students because the students were pushing something. They even created a, a data science conference for community college students. So just kind of like letting them go and helping them along the way, um, we, I was amazed um, by what they were able to accomplish. I, I will say personally for my students, Michaela and Andy, um, I would teach a lesson and then they would teach it and they loved it from the students rather than me. So I had to embrace when to shut up and that's okay. <laughs> And just like, um, you know, they'll be able to say things that are more culturally relevant or socially relevant to them. And I got to be comfortable with my ego enough to say, okay, well, the way that they're teaching it is a little bit better. So it worked out really well. And I do hope for the fall 2021 course, I'm able to have that same um, two students to sort of help me throughout the entire um, semester because our seniors all at the same time kind of take the course. And right now we have about a hundred seniors and we only have one section unlike, you know, some of the other schools. So it'd be really good to, to have the student helpers. Yeah, we definitely, we've had a lot of, I guess, throughout the semesters we've taught it, we've had a lot of different student helpers, but they're the most excited students about the course and they um, often get to be creative in helping design the labs or since they're in the labs and we're not, a lot of times they'll give us feedback about like, oh, they didn't understand this concept from lecture. Maybe you guys should go over that again. Or, hey, here's, we did something in our lab that really got the students to work together. So the other labs should do this. Our undergrads are definitely, they're awesome. And we actually get each semester a, a ton of them that want to be course staff. 
And so we kind of have to go through this application process to pick people. Um, but I guess that's good. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of excitement for any data science course that if you just ask your students who you have, there's going to be a number of them who are just dying to come back. And they may not tell you it if you don't ask, but mm -hmm. if you ask, they'll be there for sure. Yes. Well, we don't need to end, but that is an awesome, uh, awesome way to bring it up to the hour. Um, uh, the last year, we, there was no lunch hour. So this, uh, this year we have an hour break for lunch. So, um, so nobody uh, starves um, or West on, on the West Coast, there's time for lunch. Um, I don't know if you guys want to stay around and keep answering questions. I think we got to most of the questions. Uh, Gloria, were I, was I interrupting you? Were you about to say something? One thing, my one student in my course created a meditation. This is because this was during um, the pandemic and people were losing their mind. So we would meditate for the first 10 minutes and listen to Zen music before you would start off of these heavy topics that the data science people. So students have some really great ideas, so. That's awesome. And I threw in the chat that Carly, you came two years ago and you had a thing where like, you, you gathered, I think this was for a stats class before data eight, but it's like, come in, fill out a poll, make the data set that we can look at later, um, which I love. And I took that to heart in my teaching. I, I still keep that in of like, students love a data set that they're in the data set. Yeah, that's one thing. I teach another class called Stat 100, which is that class. That's where you had it from. Yeah, they have 1,500 students each semester. And I, I remember thinking, like, how can I get data sets that they're all, there's so many of them. And one thing that the, the students really like is um, I'll collect data from them. And it can be anything from basic questions like, I don't know, how many pairs of shoes do you own to, like, sometimes I'll ask questions um, that are on national polls. And then we'll see, like, we'll talk about how their data is different from um, the national polls and which one is, is better represented, uh, be better represents all U.S. adults and things like that. And so the students get really excited about that. And they often will ask me to put questions on surveys because they're curious about something. And so in data science discovery in 107, we've kind of adopted that for a couple of our data sets too. Um, on the first day of class, we we do one called the hello data set where we just ask them a bunch of questions and get kind of some numeric data. Like we also ask questions like, what type of phone do they have, Android or iPhone? And then we also in that class have been doing data sets for perceptions of different words. Yeah, a really fun data set that has turned into one of our favorite labs is asking them about 20 words with probabilistic meanings about whether or not it's going to rain tomorrow. So having them assign a percentage to it will probably rain tomorrow or it might rain tomorrow, <laughs> it is highly likely it will rain tomorrow, or it, there's a slight chance it will rain tomorrow. And one of the most, the, one of the things that end up with the widest answers uh, is we believe it will rain tomorrow. The different cultures actually hold very different beliefs to the term we believe, that some of them put beliefs as less than 50%, while other of them put a belief at like 95% certainty. So just really interesting to kind of see that come out in the data set from the students. Nice. And it makes a great block, box plot too. Yes, <laughs> there's always outliers. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much to our panelists. People definitely appreciate hearing all these perspectives. Um, and I'm sure people will be reaching out to you each individually directly as well, because there's, uh, there's a lot to share here. Um, I really, really appreciate all you guys. And I, I think this sort of like what it took for me to build this thing and, and the project that you're part of building at your university, those are all really, you know, there are many people here that are in a, in a, in a position like where you are a couple years before. And, um, and it's also just great to hear like there is enthusiasm and you start it and there's momentum. And I guess, you know, just like Solomon saying, like, once you're doing it, people are like leaning in and joining the project. And, you know, that's an exciting reason to start on this journey too, is because you'll be surprised by how much enthusiasm there is out there. Yeah, thanks everyone.
Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. bye. I was going to make sure everything in the question and answers is answered. There's some UIUC questions for your materials. There, there was a question about our materials. In the Q&A tab. Q&A. But I don't know if this person's left. I don't know what happens to like, <laughs> does this chat disappear when it's over? Yeah, if anyone wants access to our materials, all of our data sets are on GitHub, and then all of our notes and projects and everything are on our website. And then Prairie Learn, I think we have to we would have to give them access. Yeah. But shoot us an email, and but, we'll get right back to you. Yeah, just send us an email. We'd be happy to do that. 